In October 1977, Patti Smith penned a review in Hit Parader magazine for a new album called The Beach Boys Love You. She wrote the review in the style of a poem, begging the question, why would Patti Smith, the godmother of punk herself, write such sincere poetry about the latest record from, well, these guys? <laughs> Well, as she points out in the poem, she never really got the Beach Boys appeal. When she was 16, she had never even seen a palm tree and the West Coast was as remote as myth. Patti Smith was into hard on collision. The Beach Boys were into escape. They were America's band, an abstraction completely foreign to the legendary East Coast poet laureate. That is until Love You. I believe it, she writes. What was it about this particular Beach Boys record? I mean, it was a departure from their previous material for sure. An album comprised of songs played primarily on synthesizers. And notably, it was the first Beach Boys album in 11 years since Pet Sounds that was fully composed and produced by Brian Wilson and their first LP ever to feature lyrics written almost entirely by Brian. It was originally supposed to be his debut solo album with the working title of Brian Loves You. Patti Smith wasn't the only convert either. The Beach Boys Love You has gone on to garner significant praise from many musicians and critics for decades, with some even calling it the band's best album since Pet Sounds. Brian Wilson himself has topped this notion on several occasions, even stating in 1998, that's when it all happened for me. That's where my heart lies. Love you, Jesus. That's the best album we ever made. Favorite Beach Boys album? The Beach Boys Love You. Favorite album? Yes. It's an album called The Beach Boys Love You. Such praise competed with strident criticism for the record, both upon its release and up to today. Simply put, The Beach Boys Love You is the band's most polarizing album. There's this popular notion that Brian Wilson did nothing during the 70s but lay in bed and then magically reappeared in the 80s, but this minimizes the compelling and fascinating music he made during a very turbulent period of his life. And in this video, I'm going to explore what makes this record so significant in the history of Brian Wilson and the Beach Boys, and attempt to break down why it continues to divide fans to this very day. We're first going to need to look back on the years preceding 1977 to find out how the Beach Boys ended up at Love You. But before that, I'm going to briefly talk to you about something that's just as exciting, online security, with help from today's sponsor, NordVPN. Sometimes it feels like the internet is just getting bigger and more complicated. There's relentless talk about AI, you've got a million passwords to remember, guarding everything from your bank details to your photo library. How can you be sure that all this important information is secure? And wouldn't it be great if you never had to worry about any of that? Well, that is exactly why I use NordVPN. NordVPN offers top tier encryption that will protect you from people trying to steal your data, or data. This is especially helpful if you use public Wi-Fi from time to time. It's really easy to set up as well. You just hit quick connect and you're good to go. Plus you can access information and content that usually isn't available in your country. You can sign up today and get four months extra on a two year plan by using my custom URL nordvpn.com forward slash Elliot Roberts. It's risk free with NordVPN's 30 day money back guarantee. I don't do a lot of ads, but I really stand by this product. So click on the link in the description to start feeling safe and secure online. And now back to the video. The Beach Boys, Brian, Dennis, and Carl Wilson, three brothers from Hawthorne, California, who formed a band with their cousin, Mike Love, and friend Al Jardine in 1961. Their early music was inspired by the intricate harmonies from pop vocal groups like the Four Freshmen. There's a certain family blend. Our throats were similar or something. The production of Phil Spector. Yeah, Be My Baby is my favorite song. And of course, the rock and roll stylings of black musicians from the 1950s, such as Chuck Berry. They synthesized these influences into a smooth California sound, with lyrics orientated towards teenage love, high school, cars, and of course, surfing. Despite their drummer Dennis being the only member who actually knew how to get up on a board. As the mid-60s approached, their sound, led by creative genius and oldest brother Brian, became increasingly ambitious, with song lyrics turning more personal and the music more instrumentally sophisticated. This culminated in the 1966 album Pet Sounds, which was composed and produced entirely by Brian, aided by guest lyricist Tony Asher. Brian had quit playing live shows with the band, and while they were on tour, had hired esteemed session musicians known as the Wrecking Crew to record the complex music and then the other Beach Boys, along with new member Bruce Johnston, 
joined at the end to add their vocals. The album, though now heralded as one of the greatest of all time, was initially received with mostly lukewarm reviews and moderate sales. Brian was keen to top Pet Sounds with his follow-up album, Smile. We're trying to create the mood of early and mid Americana, as the music would have been then. But due to a host of reasons, it was abandoned and instead, listeners received the less ambitious Smiley Smile in 1967 with its standout single, Good Vibrations. The Beach Boys ended the 1960s with albums that moved away from groundbreaking psychedelia and instead leaned into lo-fi soul and R&B, tranquil pop, and digging up leftover tracks from previous albums. They had a great start to the 1970s with two albums of genuinely impressive material but only Surf's Up sold in decent numbers. Sales then really started falling for their follow-up albums in 72 and 73 as Bruce Johnston left while Ricky Fattar and Blondie Chaplin joined to inject some new life into the Beach Boys' music. At this point, Carl was leading the band while Brian continued to offer less and less material. This meant that the other Beach Boys were now the chief songwriters, with lyrical content involving the wonders of nature, meditation, and of course, plenty of love songs. But there was a major element missing without the magic spark of Brian Wilson, whose mental health had been rapidly declining and his drug and alcohol consumption increasing, particularly after the death of the Wilson's overbearing father Murray in 1973. The band had been touring regularly with new material and were still attempting to carve out their own niche, but drastically decreasing ticket and album sales meant that they were on virtual life support. Without the consistent involvement from Brian, who was utterly fed up with being a beach boy and had been for some time, the band was starting to fade into obscurity. But then, in 1974, everything changed. The Beach Boys released the compilation album Endless Summer, which comprised of their early songs from the pre-Pet Sounds era only. Out of nowhere, the album shot to number one on the US Billboard chart for only the second time in the band's entire career. Endless Summer dug up nostalgia for their surfing and hot rod related hits, and when their management got ear of this, they strongly recommended that the band reconfigure their live act, where they would drop most of their recent material in favor of their newly popular early 60s tunes, a move that Mike Love especially was in favour of. The Beach Boys had officially become an oldies act. Chaplin and Fatah were out, and the band's following three records were more cash-grabbing compilations. There was no push to innovate anymore when all their success pointed to regurgitating an old formula. And for about two years, Brian Wilson wasn't doing much of anything other than overeating, chain smoking, and abusing cocaine, alcohol, and even heroin, where in 1975 it had reached a dangerous limit with even his marriage on the brink of collapse. So that year he volunteered himself into controversial psychologist Eugene Landy's 24-hour therapy program. Under a strict diet and exercise regime, Brian slowly regained his strength and relative sobriety where the following year he even started regularly playing live with the band for the first time since 1964. This, plus a return to writing and producing new music for the Beach Boys, led to the Brian is Back publicity campaign, which was designed to boost interest in the band now that their creative genius had returned to the fold. There were magazine interviews, newspaper articles, and several TV spots, including a Beach Boys special produced by Lorne Michaels. Are you Brian Wilson? Yes, I am. Uh, Brian, uh, we have a citation here for you, sir, under section 936A of the California Catch a Wave statute. Come on, Brian. Let's go surfing now. Everybody's learning how. Come, Come on, on a safari, safari with, with us. us. Let's Come on. Go. Plus a separate appearance of just Brian on an episode of Saturday Night Live. <laughs> With their record label now pressuring them to release a new album, the Beach Boys worked on an LP that was a mix of covers and originals titled 15 Big Ones. Which by the way is where that Beach Boys font originated from. And here was Brian back with the band. For the first time in 10 years, an album of theirs displayed the credit produced by Brian Wilson. But this wasn't the old perfectionist back at work. Brian wanted to get the album done quickly and so recorded only minimal takes with mostly dry production. He also began using more synthesizers, which according to studio engineer Earl Mankey was, quote, to fake string parts and to not have to worry about anything else. 
he was in there to play the part and get out. Despite mostly negative reviews, 15 Big Ones went gold with two singles from the album, an original and a cover, as the only Beach Boys songs to hit the US Top 30 for the entire 1970s. The Brian Is Back campaign additionally shed light on the intense dysfunction within the band that Brian openly shared with his typical bracing honesty and often in a not so lucid state. Quoted in We Magazine in December 1976, they couldn't function without me. They'd flounder. Their stage show is down pat, but they need me in the studio. Everything I do is for the group. Sometimes I really feel like a commodity in a stock market. I've wanted to leave them lots of times. That and the fact that I had a lot of depression with the Beach Boys, I, I, I couldn't talk to the Beach Boys. Nobody would relate to me. The guys would just, they wouldn't relate to me. Other such moments, like when he admitted he felt like a prisoner, could also be attributed to Eugene Landy's unconventional methods of rehabilitation that finally came to a head at the end of 76 when the Beach Boys fired Landy due to the exorbitant costs eating into the group's profits, in addition to Landy creatively asserting himself into the making of 15 big ones. He would be back, and more controlling than ever, but not until the 1980s. After 15 Big Ones, the band considered whether Brian's comeback was worth jeopardizing plans for their own music, but ultimately decided to stick with him. Their manager at the time and Mike Love's brother Steven said of the group, quote, there was always this sense that Brian could hit another home run. And so the other Beach Boys wanted to keep him on their team. They had a large appetite for what might be. So now the question loomed, could Brian hit another home run? Or perhaps more appropriately, was he even in a fit state to play ball in the first place? The whole idea around Brian going into therapy was to allow him to return to work, but his true therapeutic needs were never really taken into account. Here was a man who, since childhood, had been experiencing profound psychological problems that had only compounded with age. He didn't need to make a new album or go on tour donning a glam rock version of his token bathrobe. He needed time and space to acknowledge and work through these issues. He needed love. He needed care and support. Instead, he was suddenly burdened with all the creative responsibility he had spent the past decade trying to avoid. And this was in addition to an overwhelming publicity campaign which relied on Brian essentially trauma dumping his way through interviews. And if his poor mental state was somehow strong enough to weather all that, Brian still had to put up with a lack of faith and increasing resentment of his fellow bandmates. Well, from the autumn of 1976 into 77, Brian was finally given some respite from it all when the other Beach Boys were absorbed in their own creative and personal pursuits. Dennis working on his solo album, Carl producing for another artist, Mike teaching transcendental meditation, and Al spending time with his family. Landy, for all his overbearing and at times cruel practices, had given Brian a sense of routine and work ethic that allowed the eldest Wilson to re-engage with his songwriting. On 15 Big Ones, Brian was pulling teeth trying to come up with new material, but now he suddenly had this burst of creativity that he channeled into writing some of the most personal and honest songs of his career. We have uh, a lot of songs that we did. Uh, all of a sudden, just all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I started getting into songwriting again. Given the intimate nature of the music, Brian considered making this his debut solo album. I'm gonna call the album Brian's In Love. <laughs> I don't think they'll go for it though. Even still, once the other Beach Boys had returned to listen to what Brian had come up with, they were totally knocked out by what they'd heard. And gave Brian free reign to play all the instruments on the album, with only some small inclusions from Dennis and Carl. In this way, The Beach Boys Love You could almost be called a Wilson Brothers album, with even Al Jardine claiming that this was Carl and Dennis working hard to make Brian feel appreciated by paying tribute to their older brother. The record's inner sleeve even displays a personal dedication from the other Beach Boys with an all caps headline that reads, To Brian, whom we love with all our hearts. I also want to highlight the eye-catching album artwork designed by Dean Torrance, which was meant to resemble a Navajo rug pattern, but to others, it suggests more childlike comparisons, such as a light bright toy, or from my point of view, a precursor to 8-bit video game graphics. And it's printed on this textured cardboard. It's cool, I like it. Of course, all 
the Beach Boys contribute vocals and each get a shot at lead. The album is loosely divided into two parts, with the first half packed with more up-tempo songs that tackle all kinds of ideas, and the second half reflecting more mature themes with less poppy hooks. Brian's preferred instruments, once again, were the Moog and ARP synthesizers, but where they featured only fleetingly on 15 big ones, the synth became the dominating sound on Love You. This is made abundantly clear with the opening number, Let Us Go On This Way. Where we're greeted with the wet stomp of a heavy synth bass organ and a fat snare drum as Carl Wilson sings. To get to baby when through the ring But then the lyrics take a peculiar turn into early Beach Boys territory with the lines Going to school isn't my fondest desire But sitting in class you set my soul on fire That's right, we're back at high school. A well that the Beach Boys hadn't drawn from musically in over 10 years. But notice the present tense of the lyrics. Going to school isn't my fondest desire. This isn't Brian reminiscing about his past as much as it is placing himself directly back in the hallways and classrooms of his youth. A time of spiritual significance as indicated by the next line. God, please let us go on this way. This theme of adolescence continues on the second track, Roller Skating Child. A song that Brian mentioned in a 1977 Crawdaddy article was inspired by trips to the skating rink with his daughters Carney and Wendy. Well that sounds pretty sweet. Let's take a listen to Roller Skating Child. Well she's a roller skating child with a ribbon in her hair. Okay. She gets my heart to beating when I see her there. Odd choice of words, but roller skating can be a dangerous activity. Go on. You know my heart starts smiling when she sings. Sure. She's such an angel, I bet she's got wings. Yeah, nice. All right, let's dive into that chorus. It will make me love her when the sun goes down. What? We'll even do more when her mama's not around. In that same Crawdaddy interview, the one with the headline, I'm a pooper, not a buzzer, which... What? Anyway, in this article, Brian points out that Roller Skating Child was, quote, written in two different places with two different moods. And, uh, yeah, no shit. The verses feel far closer to Brian's explanation of him innocently skating with his young daughters, whereas the chorus falls in line with the previous song where the point of view is Brian back as a teenage boy. But together, the two parts come across as some sort of bizarre Lolita fan fiction. Well, oh my, oh gosh, oh gee. And it must be said that the vocals coming from known ladies' man, Mike Love... I am very much a ladies' man. I, I admit to that, yes. Life in prison as ladies' man. Just imprison me with a few ladies, that's all I ask. Do absolutely nothing to alleviate the inexplicable creepiness of this song. No, it's true, I do like girls. <laughs> I've spent a lot of time going back and forth trying to figure out how to unpack this. So the Beach Boys lyrical content throughout most of their career, but particularly in the early to mid 60s, was infused with the experience of being a teenager, right? Young love, going to school, driving around in cars. In the wake of post-war prosperity and a boom of babies who were now in the age of adolescence, it was music that soundtracked the idyllic middle-class journey of white American youth. Even once Brian created Pet Sounds, which was a total departure from their surf songs, the pain and joy of teenage love remained as the connective thread that linked Brian's new art pop to his early 60s hits. Even his bold would-be follow-up, the acclaimed Smile album, was pitched by Brian as a teenage symphony to God. It was, for lack of a better term, part of the Beach Boys brand. The theme of teenage love remained a powerful force, a kind of constant in their music. I wish they in his 2016 memoir, I Am Brian Wilson, Brian compared the lyrical approach of Love You to Pet Sounds. I wrote some songs that were about how I felt in my 30s, the same way that Pet Sounds was about how I felt in my 20s. And according to author Mark Dillon, Brian went in this direction on the Beach Boys Love You because he believed that these were the types of lyrics the fans had wanted from the Beach Boys. And while I understand that there was a big resurgence for their early music around this time, there's a big difference between guys in their late teens and early 20s singing about the joys of being true to your school and the girls on the beach, to being in your mid-30s and writing just as directly about this same teenage romance. Brian did work, write songs. It's not like he had ever never written any lyrics, lyrics but uh, 
Brian Wilson lyrics maybe weren't as familiar to the public as those other lyricists were. And so uh, the Beach Boy Love You songs might have seemed odder uh, because nobody really knew what Brian was really like, you know. There is one more song in this album that touches on this theme that I'll get into later on. But first, let's finish up with Roller Skating Child. Well, oh my, oh gosh, oh. Fortunately, none of the lyrics get worse than that cursed chorus. But there is a moment, just as the song wraps up, where Brian Wilson debuts his solo vocals for the first time on the album with... Roller. For those of you saying, that wasn't Brian Wilson, um, unfortunately, yes it was. Brian had one of the sweetest and warmest vocals in rock and roll, able to effortlessly switch from his chest voice to a swooping falsetto in a single second, like here on Good To My Baby. But His harmony arrangements redefined what rock and roll vocals could sound like. And then at some point in 1975, he contracted laryngitis and due to a near constant stream of cigarettes, alcohol, cocaine, in addition to all the live performances, his voice had taken on an entirely new shape in which it remained for about the next three years. The result is less an angelic falsetto and more a baritone croak, as author Peter Ames Carlin puts it. Most of Brian's lead vocals are in the latter half of the album, so I'll get more into this development later on, but even still, his cracking and pitchy singing show up in the group's harmonies all throughout the record. I personally don't think the impact is negative overall, but much like George Harrison on his Dark Horse album, it shows what a dependence of cocaine, smoking, and alcohol can do to one's voice. And someone else who knew this was Dennis Wilson. Everything the middle Wilson had been consuming the same cocktail of vices as his older brother during the 1970s and debuts his own horse vocals on the third track of the album, Mona. Mona is a throwback to the more traditional four chord love songs of Brian's youth. It's about a guy who begins dating a lady named Mona, and from the corny rhymes of movie and groovy, kiss me and miss me, to trying to wow her with Phil Spector's Be My Baby. This is one of the most wonderfully earnest songs of Brian Wilson's career. For me, it was the first track on the record I heard that made me sit up and go, I think I'm starting to understand what this album is. This song is coming from that same 34 year old man who is painfully nostalgic for his adolescence. When Brian was a teenager, he had a huge crush on a girl named Carol Mountain. They never dated, nothing romantic ever even transpired between them, and Carol herself remembers Brian only as a kind and sensitive, if very shy, young man. But she was basically Brian's muse in his early songwriting years. Before the Pet Sounds closer, Caroline No, was altered by lyricist Tony Asher, it came to him originally as Caroline. Brian even called Carol a number of times around the Pet Sounds era just to talk music. I had the strong sense that Brian was really in turmoil in terms of his emotional life, particularly in terms of his relationship with women. That as we wrote these songs, he would talk about other relationships that he had had, how uh, intense the feelings had been. And it led me to believe that he was uh, unsettled in terms of being ready, for instance, to commit his entire life to a single relationship. Ten years later, around the Love You period, Brian called an old high school buddy to get together with him and a bunch of friends, including Carol Mountain, to hang out like it was 1959. Brian was clearly having some sort of crisis of age, crisis of love, where he wanted to go back and recapture the spirit of those more innocent times. And that's what you hear on the song Mona. Listen to the But with Dennis Wilson's vocals coming out in that husky bray, the song once again warps the perspective where the narrator has a pitying kind of desperation in his voice. Will you, will you, will you just kiss me? It feels like an out of shape PE teacher attempting to woo the librarian on karaoke night. We could, we could, we could marry. All that being said, I love Mona. 
I love the synthification of Phil Spector's run out sound. I love the syncopated piano chords. I love the audacious horn line that blasts all throughout the track. I love that it's a song that paints a vivid picture. Whether you laugh at the track or if it makes you shed a tear, Mona is perhaps one of the best depictions of what was going through Brian Wilson's mind in the mid 1970s. Patti Smith touches on this in her poem, quote, as we age, we get a sense of threat. That doesn't mean we grow up or grow old. You don't have to if you don't want to. I know you're going to like Bill Spector. Diving further into Brian's psyche, we arrive at the track Johnny Carson. Johnny Carson. It's an ode to the longest serving host of The Tonight Show, Johnny Carson. It features a scant piano riff in the verses before adding some synth bass and drums in the chorus. As Mike sings about the manly tone of Carson's speaking voice and how funny he is at 11.30 every night. The network makes him break his back. This song was initially a huge skip for me, but as I started listening to it more, I grew to appreciate the other elements, such as the chord progression of the chorus. It's nice to have you on the show tonight. Oh, ho, ho. That E flat, G minus seven, E flat, F seven chord progression. I've seen your act in Vegas out of sight. Out of sight. That F7 chord sung in vocal harmony just sounds fantastic to me. This video has suddenly become very Rick Beato. <laughs> but here's my bold theory about this track. And I wanna stress, this is an opinion completely of my own. It's not based on anything real. But I think the song Johnny Carson is actually about Brian himself. If you read the lyrics and picture Brian instead, it uncannily describes his very existence at the time. Sitting behind his microphone for those live shows, filling up the slack when the other Beach Boys can't deliver the goods, who here, along with his record label, represent the network breaking his back. And in the most eerie of comparisons, we have the final chorus, which begins, don't you think he's such a natural guy? Followed by, the way he kept it up could make you cry. And that's why that dominant seventh F chord works so well, hanging in the air like that. It feels unstable, longing to be resolved. But just like Brian's real life predicament, it never does. From there, the song moves into its outro, where we shift from the bittersweet chorus to a total fanfare for our hero with the lyrics. Who's the man that we admire? Johnny Carson is a real Which to me has echoes to the old theme of the Mickey Mouse Club. Who's the leader of the club that's made for you and me? Again, adding to that childlike quality of the album. I have to take a break. We'll be right back after this word. Stay with us. Brian's first song on Love You, where he takes lead vocals, is on Good Time. My baby and I just want a good time. Now, you may listen to this song and wonder why Brian suddenly sounds more youthful with his high falsetto fully intact. I miss her when she's gone. Well, that's because this song was originally recorded in early 1970 and was supposed to be on their Sunflower album, but never made the cut. Keen to not let a good song go to waste, it found its way onto the Beach Boys' Love You. One of the couple songs co-written by someone else, in this case, Al Jardine, Good Time is a good time. Yeah, I like this track. Lyrically, it sees Brian Wilson at his horniest. The narrator sings about his two girlfriends and what he loves about them. I don't know why there's two, but hey, it's not like we're in mumbo number five territory. A little bit of money. The song really shines in the chorus, which sees Brian throwing caution to the wind as he sings. Maybe it won't last, but what do we care? My baby and I just want a good time. I like that it's Brian discarding his typical anxiety with reckless abandon and just looking a vibe with his girl or girls. <laughs> the other winning component of the chorus is the exceptional horn line. Brian's friend David Sandler recalls Brian waking up that morning to eight horn players waiting for instruction as to what to play. So he went to his office and quickly wrote an entire horn section out. According to Sandler, quote, it was an amazing horn line with this overriding French horn riff and he did the whole thing while having a conversation with me. One of those moments where you're like, oh yeah, I can see why people compared this guy to Mozart. Then we have Honkin' Down the Highway, the one track on the album sung by Al Jardine. Honkin', honkin' down the gosh darn highway. 
This one really makes use of the synths, along with some guitar and basic percussion. It's kind of a slow rock and roll track, and according to Brian, was inspired by country music. The weirdest thing is that this was the A-side of the only single released from the album, which just makes no sense to me. I don't have much else to add other than it's about a guy driving to the home of a lady he's about to take out on a date and hopes it'll go well. And it's called Honkin' Down the Highway, which will always be amusing to me. <laughs> trying, trying to, get past their cars. to finish out the up-tempo tracks, we have the song Ding Dang. Now, how do I explain the origins of Ding Dang? Uh, okay, so in the early 1970s, Brian Wilson became utterly obsessed with an old African American folk song called Shorten and Bread. Put on skillet, put on the lid, Mama gonna cook some shorten and bread. Put on the skillet, put on the lid, Mama's gonna bake a little shorten and bread. Put on the skillet, slip on the lid, Mama's gonna make us some shorten and bread. He played it on several occasions, and multiple music legends have all shared stories of Brian's total infatuation with Shorten and Bread. Mickey Dolenz of The Monkees once took acid with John Lennon, Harry Nilsson, and Brian Wilson in Malibu, where Brian played the piano line of Shorten and Bread over and over for hours. Same as when he was with Elton John and a freaked out Iggy Pop who fled an extensive sing-along of the tune exclaiming, I gotta get out of here, man. This guy's nuts. And according to a bewildered Alice Cooper, Brian Wilson called Shorten and Bread the greatest song ever written. Is there a piece of music that you that you could play that makes you feel very spiritual? I mean, that, 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 you, that you really love to play, that means something to you more than anything? No, actually not. But I'll play some. Okay. Brian's obsession with Shorten and Bread is even depicted in the hilariously bad made for TV movie The Beach Boys and American Family. The baby's coming, I'm going to the hospital now. Okay, bye. You know the song? It's a great song, Brian. Shorten and Bread eventually found its way onto the Beach Boys' LA Light album in 1979. The intense fixation with Shorten and Bread was reportedly kickstarted by a late night session between Brian and Roger McGuinn of the Birds in the early 70s. Brian showed up at McGuinn's house hoping to score some amphetamines. And he said, Gun any speed? And later, while completely high off their asses, worked on the song that became Ding Dang. And after Roger McGuinn went to bed and woke up the next morning, he found Brian awake, still pounding it out at the piano. McGuinn is actually credited as the sole writer of the lyrics. It's only got one verse, yeah. and they finally released it, called it Ding Dang. And whenever I see Brian these days, he points at me and goes, Ding Dang! Ding Dang! <laughs> Ding Dang uses the same circular chords as Shorten and Bread, and if you want to hear the progress of this tune in Brian's life, YouTuber Elora has compiled all known recorded versions of them in her video titled The Beach Boy Saga of Shorten and Bread, which I can highly recommend. Within this saga, a final version of Ding Dang was recorded in 1976 for The Beach Boys Love You. According, according to studio engineer El Mankey, quote, everybody who showed up to the Love You sessions got subjected to Ding Dang. It's so Circular rhythm and playful bass line is kind of intoxicating and sort of locks you into this hypnotic groove. The way the voices pop in and out and overlap creates this real frenetic energy. It's got almost a modern dance pop feel. Brian Wilson just knows how to make music sound addictive. Even taking something as modest as a traditional folk tune and turning it into a total barn burner. I just wish the song was more complete, coming in at only 56 seconds. In later years, Wilson cited Ding Dang as one of his best, most inspired, and underrated songs. What are some of your favorite moments from that? From the uh, Beach Boys, the Beach Boys Love You? Can you hear this? Yeah. Ding, ding, ding in a ding dong, ding. Oh yeah. Ding in a ding dong, ding. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Okay, now onto side two of the Beach Boys Love You, which opens with Solar System. Solar System. 
which developed during a session where Brian was seen staring vacantly at a decorative stained glass window that had planets and stars on it, and later that afternoon he'd more or less completed the song. What do the planets mean? And have you ever seen? Instead of Surf in USA, it's Planets of the Milky Way as Brian sings about the great celestial frontier. Neptune is God of the sea. This is the first track on the album where Brian sings lead with an up-to-date vocal and it's glaringly obvious. Pluto is too far to see. But despite his voice cracking and occasionally falling off key, there's still a warmth and resonance to Brian's new pipes. Instead of insecurities arising from such a stark vocal change, Brian fully leaned into his new baritone voice and while it may not be as beautiful as his earlier singing, there is a boldness and an openness to his vocals, one that is truly unique to this specific period. I don't mind Solar System, it's a little far out and sounds kind of clumsy, but it's still an intriguing aspect of this more personal style of Brian Wilson's songwriting, where even in this tune about the Solar System, he's pining to make things work with his wife or find an entirely new one, it's not quite clear. If Mars had life on it, I might find I'll admit, many of the songs mentioned so far have been a mixture of silly, quirky, or just downright bizarre. There's a lot to like about them, but if you're searching for some classic Brian Wilson songwriting comparable to his mid 60s tunes, look no further than the song The Night Was So Young. The night was so young, and everything still. Led vocally by Carl and supported by a damaged but compelling falsetto swoop from Brian. Wake up. This song is Love You's peak in terms of vocal harmony. Written during Brian's marriage breakdown about his mistress, Debbie Keel, the song may have dubious origins, but it's one of the most elegant compositions on the album, transporting the listener to a delightful nighttime escape. The three Wilson brothers team up for the next song, I'll Bet He's Nice. I'll bet he's nice. With Brian and Dennis tackling the verses and chorus, and Carl owning the bridge. Baby, don't you ever tell me that you're the three of them harmonizing make for another excellent vocal highlight on Love You. I'll bet he's funny and that ain't all. The song dives into Brian's insecurities as he ponders the perfect man that an ex lover is now dating. There's a good dose of self-pity to this song, as the narrator bets that this new guy is nice, funny, and twice the man he'll ever be, which makes him cry. Yes, I can picture him now. Rugged good looks, sweater knotted about his shoulders, curly locks shining in the sun like spun gold. It's a very vulnerable moment, and feels earned, as the previous track was about an affair, and now come the consequences. A real fuck around and find out pairing of songs. You pretty daughter, you my pretty daughter. Then on the following track, Let's Put Our Hearts Together, Brian sings a duet with, of all people, his wife at the time, Marilyn. The song works as a kind of conversation between a couple putting aside their differences to come together to, as the song says, see what we can cook up between us. Take your time, don't worry how you feel because... Thematically speaking, this song is perfectly placed from the affair to the self-pitying aftermath and now the making up. What's funny is that Marilyn absolutely outperforms Brian as he struggles to reach some of those higher notes in full voice and is often rather pitchy. I know you've had so much experience that you don't need them if they've never understood you. Not my favourite cut on the album by any stretch, but I dig the inexplicable steel drum synths and the novelty of Brian singing a duet with someone who was about to divorce a year later. Now, to return to the problematic theme of Brian's female infantilization as we arrive at the song, I Wanna Pick You Up. I love to pick you up. I mean, I'm just gonna post the lyrics here so you can see what I'm talking about. Now you may read these words and think, well, this could be about a baby or a child of Brian's. There's nothing that suggests he's talking about a lover on here. Wash your body and shampoo your hair. And yes, that may be true, but Brian himself shattered this illusion with that same damn pooper buzzer article where he revealed its meaning. Quote, The song is descriptive of a man who considers this chick a baby, and he says, Well, you still have a baby in you, you're still like a baby to me, you just sort of have that thing and I want to pick you up. Even though she's too big to pick up, of course, but he wants to. He wants to pretend she's small like a baby. He really wants to pick her up. Pat, 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 pat her on her butt. 
but I think now is a good time to bring up this quote from Patti Smith's review poem. Love You is siphoned from the meandering mind of a madman. She may be referring to the entire album with that quote, but this song alone would have anyone calling the nearest therapist or psychiatric doctor. But that's the thing, Brian had literally just been in the care of a therapist. Not a good one, but my point is, no one really knew what to do with Brian. And to get to the heart of why Brian was writing songs with lyrics like this, we have to keep in mind three key points in his history. The first is that Brian, more so than the other two Wilson boys, suffered verbal and physical abuse as a child from his father that he never emotionally recovered from. The second is that when he was 20, he met two sisters named Diane and Marilyn Ravel at an early Beach Boys concert. The Wilson brothers and the Ravels became fast friends and Brian was soon invited over to their home where he was a hit with the girl's parents. To escape his own tyrannical father, Brian would take refuge in the Ravel's home most evenings where he was welcomed with open arms, basically living there for much of 1963. The close proximity kindled a relationship between Brian and Marilyn at the encouragement of her parents. Both admittedly smitten with each other, they married a year later. Brian was 21 and Marilyn was 16. Although this kind of age gap was more normal around this period, there are undeniable shades of grooming here. But unlike the clear power dynamic of, say, Elvis and Priscilla, Brian had barely come to terms with his own adulthood. You know, it's nice when people, someone can make everybody laugh and feel comfortable, you know, and childlike, which is the way Brian is. He's very childlike. But the problem with marrying a man-child musical genius harboring his own childhood trauma, and this is the third point, is that by the time Brian had children of his own, all these factors, plus battling an addiction to drugs, meant that he was woefully, dangerously inept at parenting his own little girls. When you listen to a song like I Wanna Pick You Up, what is clear is that it was written by a man who was completely confused about love. Remembering that the love he received as a child was quite conditional, I just think Brian was going through something around this time that perhaps ought to have been more privately handled, but instead his and Denny's ragged vocals combined to make this the most out of pocket moment on the entire album. I want to pick you up. Moving into more lighthearted territory, we have the penultimate track, Airplane, which is just a sweet love song about a guy on a plane looking forward to seeing his lover waiting at the airport. Airplane is a moment of calm reflection amongst a parade of intrusive thoughts. I'm hoping this rainy weather clears up. Sonically, it's packed with gentle Moog synths and organ, and Mike Love offers up one of his better vocal performances from the band's career. Oh, and it ends in this delightful fashion. I can't wait, I can't wait to see her face. I can't wait, I can't wait. Finally, we have Love is a Woman, which closes the album with a flurry of blaring saxophones and whimsical flutes. Love is a woman. I like to think of the title of this song as an example of growth for Brian, like he's finally learned that love is not a girl, but a woman. So take my advice, you just treat her nice. But then in that damn article, he said, quote, it's just about everybody, about anything, about how things are. It's an idea that a woman is love. A baby is love too, of course. It's just an experience, you know? Love is a baby would have been a better title. <laughs> No, but this song, Vegas Bombast Aside, is about as direct and pure as Brian Wilson gets. It's fairly congruent with the rest of Love You in that regard and closes out one of the most deeply strange yet honest albums of Brian Wilson and the Beach Boys' career. By the time the Beach Boys Love You went on sale in April 1977, the Brian is Back publicity campaign had all but dried up, and thus the album sold very poorly. Many believe this to be due to Warner Brothers catching wind that the Beach Boys manager intended on signing a new deal with CBS Records, so a disgusted Warner Brothers did virtually nothing to promote the album. The poor sales of Love You struck out any chance of Brian's intended follow-up album titled Adult Child. This album was to go even further into Brian's autobiographical leanings, with the title a reference to the theory of splitting one's personality into adult and child modes of thinking. Certain songs have appeared on various compilations and bootlegs over the years, with one song making its way onto the Beach Boys' actual follow-up, the M.I.U. album. The song in question was the unsettling Hey Little Tomboy, but uh, look, we... 
We've already been through enough today. We, we, we don't need to talk about Hey Little Tomboy. I'm gonna teach you to get hit, hit. It's enough. Uh, no, no. The Beach Boys Love You was the final album that Brian Wilson worked on where there was little to no interference from outsiders. From 1977 onwards, Brian took the path of least resistance and offered up only a few middling songs on what are, in my opinion, the worst Beach Boys albums from the late 70s through to the awful 90s. <laughs> People all around the world in every nation. Things improved when he began a commendable solo career in the mid 80s, and in 2012 he returned to produce the final album by the Beach Boys, where he contributed more thoughtful writing, but none of the songs from any of those albums contain the energy, the directness, and the pure sincerity that is reflected on Love You. Engineer on the record, Earl Mankey, said of Love You, quote, It's a frighteningly accurate album. It may have sounded lighthearted, but that's a serious autobiographical album. Brian Wilson giving what he had. I have found writing about the Beach Boys Love You to be far more difficult than I first thought. On the one hand, it is a searingly honest, sonically unique, and thematically consistent album, which are three descriptors that you couldn't really pin to any of the other Beach Boys records from the 70s. On the other hand, it is crude, bizarre, and raucously silly with some of the most troubling lyrics ever written for a Beach Boys record. Basically, if you think the Beach Boys Love You is an unsung masterpiece, that's valid. If you think the Beach Boys Love You is a god-awful hodgepodge of discordant textures and embarrassing lyrics, that's also valid. And look, I'll admit my first reaction to Love You was, what if a creepy uncle was distilled into a Beach Boys record? But, and I really mean this, this album reveals hidden magic the more you listen. Seriously, stick with it. Musically, it's also years ahead of its time. Not that you suddenly heard a bunch of Love You clones in the following years, but Brian Wilson's insistence in not giving in to contemporary 70s musical trends and additionally writing his own controversial lyrics was, in a way, kind of a punk statement from Brian. I want to stress, he wasn't at all creating punk rock music, but the ethos of Love You was as bold and direct as whatever the Ramones were cooking up on the East Coast from around the same time, and Brian's use of synthesizers was truly revolutionary. Synths had been used as embellishments in the early to mid 70s, and while other fringe and underground acts started using them more holistically around this time, Brian Wilson was one of the first major artists to make a proper pop record where Moog and ARP synthesizers were the leading instruments. In this way, The Beach Boys Love You is one of the world's very first synth pop albums preceding genres like post-punk, new wave, and electronica. I think that our next batch of material is gonna be as good as ever. I can't see, uh, I couldn't see doing any, any better for this period of time right now. The Beach Boys Love You is a twisted carnival ride that takes you on a journey through the mind of Brian Wilson, from the depths of his insecurities to the height of his unattainable dreams. Or as Patti Smith wrote in her review poem, quote, For Brian Wilson, the dream is trapped within the wholesome abstraction of a jello ad. You're into it, or you're not. Behind those boisterous synths and comically out-of-tune vocals, is a man aching to break free of the expectations of former genius, to rid himself of the exploitations of his bandmates, and to simply go back to the innocent time of his youth, where a crush on a classmate felt as seismic as the solar system. Maybe.